Hey, looks like we're live. Um, good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. My name is Alina Islam and I'm a Senior Research Associate here at Red Cloud Securities. Today's webinar focuses on Barton Gold, an ASX listed gold company advancing a pipeline of projects to feed its central Galler mill in Australia. For the webinar today, we have with us Alexander Scanlon, Managing Director and CEO. Alex will provide an introduction to the company, including an overview of current exploration activities and catalysts that may lie ahead. After the presentation, we'll take your questions live. Please send us your questions via the chat box and we'll get through as many as we can. Before we get started, though, I do have to mention a bit of the fine print. For Barton Gold, there may be some forward-looking statements made on this call. I would direct listeners through the cautionary note on page two of the Barton Gold corporate presentation located on the company's website. For Red Cloud Securities, I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only and should not be considered a solicitation to purchase or sell securities or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note that this call does not take into account the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigations and seek their own professional advice before investment. Please see our most recent research located on our website for Barton Gold specific disclosures. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Alex. Please take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, and welcome, everyone. What I'll do is I'll bring up our presentation here and we can run straight through it and as Alina mentioned uh, you know if you have questions uh, feel free to bring them up in the, the chat box and we'll be happy to come back around to them so Alina can you see that up on screen now yes yeah you're good to go great thank you all right well uh, so before we get into the presentation itself just here on the screen uh, oh, sorry I better bring that up to a better viewing platform there we go. Uh, there we go. It's a bit better. So just here on the screen on this front cover, this is actually a photo of our Perseverance open pit mine at the Tarkula project, which we'll cover. Uh, it's a very shallow uh, open pit that produced somewhere around 50,000 ounces uh, and was producing nearly four gram per ton feed to our mill in 2018. So very interesting high grade asset uh, that we're looking to replicate across the Tarkula project area. So for those of you who are not familiar with Barton Gold, we'll kind of start at the top. Um, Barton Gold was born out of sort of a regional strategic review of Australian gold assets. One, well, looking at gold globally and looking at sort of large scale credit uh, macro and geopolitical setups and deciding where do we want, we want to invest in gold. Where do we want to invest in gold? Uh, Australia is obviously a, a globally recognized tier one jurisdiction, both for gold, but also for geopolitical stability and the rule of law. But then looking around in within Australia, we actually identified the opportunity in South Australia to come in and essentially quietly consolidate an entire historical gold district or uh, substantially the majority, you know, the majority of significant historical producing and exploration assets in a recognized gold district. Um, and this is a really interesting opportunity because South Australia has essentially had two gold rushes, one in the late 1800s and one in the late 1900s. But through a confluence of sort of market timing and market circumstances, uh, these uh, these areas and this this sort of central Gaul or gold province, as it's known, never became one of these sort of really, really well known, heavily explored and developed areas. Uh, South Australia, as a consequence, holds about 25% of Australia's known gold resources, but represents only about 2.5% of production. So it's really underrepresented in the Australian gold space. We have therefore come in, we've built up around 5,100 square kilometers of uh, tenements and joint venture gold rights. And then within this, we've now built a 1.1 million ounce gold mineral resource base. And we've also owned the only gold mill in the central Gawler Creighton, which is a really strong advantage for us, both in terms of leveraging our assets and operation, thinking also about future regional consolidation and long-term gold leadership. So the opportunity here is very, very big. Um, we have taken a very substantial position. We are covering most of the, the known gold district. 
Um, and what we are doing now is bringing in a lot of new technology to leverage uh, a very significant historical data package and try to bring forward this area 30 years quite rapidly uh, because there's a very significant blue sky opportunity here. And what we're looking for is growth of this existing million ounce platform and new million ounce discoveries. So we're looking for a multi-million ounce, uh, multi-million ounce uh, redevelopment of what is already a proven gold district. So for us, uh, and really, we, we believe very importantly, we have a very, very clear strategy. We are purely focused only on gold in South Australia, uh, no distraction of capital elsewhere, whether it be different metals, different jurisdictions. Uh, we are very well capitalized. Uh, we've got about $8.85 million in cash as of the 31st of December, uh, and we have an excellent team. So it really helps when we think about this ambition to actually look at the assets in, in profile and perspective, right? Um, so what are we doing here? We are aiming big, right? So, and where are we focused? We're, we're generally focused on our Tarkula and Tonkilia project areas for large scale exploration. The reason is that this is about 3000 square kilometers of prime exploration ground over excellent geology. Uh, with proven mineralization, uh, historical operations in many in many cases, uh, and, and over a hundred kilometers of shear zones and, and systems that are essentially untested. We are going for scale because scale drives optionality, efficiency, and long-term value. And what that means is we are focused, therefore, on open pit, open pitable mineralization so that we can get these efficiencies of scale in operation. So our overall ambition as a company is to put together north of a 2 million ounce resource base uh, and develop South Australia's largest independent gold producer within a period of five years. So what does this mean in practice? Well, if we think of what we've got here on our slide, we have sort of stage one and stage two uh, demarcated. Uh, stage two, jumping forward to the big picture, what does that mean? That means the development of a large uh, high efficiency new mill at the Tonkilia project fed by large scale, lower grade base load mineralization from the Tunkilia project area, and then supplemented by material from uh, Tarkula, which we expect to be a higher grade satellite operating from only about 70 kilometers away. But when we take a step forward a bit earlier in time, as we shape up this bigger picture development strategy and how we're going to achieve this 150,000 ounce per annum objective, we have the ability to bring forward some of our operations to start an earlier stage one operation. And the reason is that the Tarkula project is an historical high grade producer. Uh, it has processed ore through our central gold mill previously in 2018, it was sending 3.8 gram per ton ore. And we have essentially here a combination of existing fully permitted mining leases, fully permitted uh, mill in operation, uh, proven, uh, proven logistics, uh, proven metallurgy and proven infrastructure. So we can bring forward cash flows a few years, get into earlier stage operations, and essentially de-risk the step uh, toward that next bigger picture, longer term development. Now, why are we focused on scale? Um, we, we sort of emphasize this point because you know, traditionally or more recently in Australia, the Australian gold mining is very focused on uh, narrow vein, high grade, deep underground operations. Um, in North America and Central America, for example, a lot of people will be more familiar with uh, larger scale, lower grade, open pit bulk style mineralization. Um, so it helps to know why you're doing what you're doing. And, and in this case, you know, it, it's often good to know who your heroes are. Um, and one group that we really look at is sort of exemplifying what we are setting out to do in the Gullar Creighton is Capricorn Metals. So Capricorn Metals own the Carlo into Gold project. Um, and this is a bulk open pit operation, uh, putting four and a half to five million ton per annum of material through a mill. And this is a resource that has only a 0 0.7 gram per ton resource. Uh, and their average feed grade is a little over 0 0.9 gram per ton gold. So what very much low grade by, by Australian standards, but this is an asset that has become Australia's large, uh, lowest cost gold only producer. And this is not the first time this team have done this. Uh, this the same team uh, also developed Mount Rawdon uh, for Equigold, 
Uh, that started at, uh, uh, as a one gram operation and is now, uh, now actually operating at less than 0 0.6 gram per ton. Uh, and then duped in similarly sort of a one, 1 1.2 uh, gram per ton operation, uh, which they developed for Regis. So they've really proven their point within the Australian context. And they've given us a very excellent roadmap to follow, uh, both in terms of uh, the style of exploration, the style of mineralization that we're pursuing, and how we might think about doing that. So when we look at what we are doing, we are essentially working on building the foundations to establish a similar pattern of progress and hopefully the same outcomes. Um, as I mentioned before, we are focused on bringing a lot of new technology or existing technology, new applications into this region. We want to fast forward it. We want to accelerate discovery and development. And of course, we're very uh, focused on efficient uses of capital. So that technology is helping us target uh, new gold zones very efficiently. So that, that's sort of a high payoff, if you will, per dollar or meter invested. Uh, but of course, importantly, it's good, uh, necessary to have most of your capital going into the ground. So on a quarter by quarter basis, you'll see anywhere between 70 to 90% of our cash consumption goes directly into the ground uh, and that is actually before even considering the cost of the people managing those programs. So uh, the substantial majority of our money goes into in and on ground uh, exploration. And we've drilled over 30,000 meters on key targets since we've IPO'd. And what this has led to uh, has, has been quite a few significant outcomes in the sort of 18 months or so since we IPO'd. Uh, we've identified four new gold zones at Tarkula and Tonkilia for about two kilometers of new mineralization. Um, we have received nearly a million dollars in grant support from the South Australian government. They've become an excellent partner to us, both in terms of uh, the innovation side and the sort of gold development strategy. Uh, and we're also really building our team in South Australia uh, to really, uh, I guess, maximize our exploration capabilities and also our corporate development capabilities. And part of that is, brings me to the fourth point on this slide is that one, one thing that does really set us apart from your traditional uh, explorer or developer is that we are already actually a, an advanced asset manager. So we have a very large portfolio of existing fixed real assets. This includes existing brownfield mines. Uh, we own the region's only gold mill. We have mine camps, uh, exploration camps. Uh, we have surplus equipment. So we are actually able to generate income through asset monetization both in terms of disposing surplus assets, but also in terms of extracting value from our existing assets, uh, whether it be through leasing our mine camp, which we do from time to time, or even pulling actual gold bearing material out of our mill. Uh, last year in June, we sold a million dollars worth of gold, uh, which we took out of our mill. And in December, we announced a, uh, that we had recovered about 10 tons of gold bearing material out of that same mill during a bit of a, a sort of mini workover and preservation program. So all of this uh, really adds up in value. We've made about $3.5 million from this over the past 18 months. And all of this is money that can go back into this efficient exploration program. And of course, reduces the amount of capital we need to raise, therefore protecting shareholders from dilution, which especially in a difficult market as we've faced the last two years is very, very valuable. A uh, quick uh, snapshot for capital here. Uh, we have a very tight share register, about 176 million shares outstanding uh, and about a 30.7 30 uh, 30 or $31 million enterprise value. Uh, importantly, we have a very, very strong uh, board and management alignment with shareholders. Uh, board and management represent about one third of the ownership of this company. Uh, and we've got another sort of 14% that's institutional and corporate and then a collection of uh, high net wealth and retail. So we have a pretty good spread for a company that is very young and was a clean company. So this was not a pre-existing pre-listed company that bought these assets. It started with zero shareholders and we built it up to nearly a thousand shareholders now. And we've seen that growing quite rapidly as we're now getting our message out. Importantly as well for us is we've got a team that really reflects our forward ambitions. Uh, so we have a lot of experience, both specific to development, uh, exploration, uh, permitting and development in South Australia, but also specifically in the Australian gold sector. So three of our leadership team, uh, Ken Williams, David Wilson, and Mark Twining, are all formerly of Normandy Mining, which was Australia's largest gold producer through the end of the 1990s. 
uh, and was acquired by Newmont as its entry into Australia in 2002. Uh, Nicholas Byrne is our CFO, was the CFO for Heathgate Resources, operating two uranium assets in South Australia, so a very complicated uh, regulatory environment. Uh, and we have some uh, additional excellent geologists. Uh, the rest of our board is also comprised of people with uh, experience and skills that are quite useful to moving forward uh, well beyond uh, exploration. Uh, Christian Pei, for example, was the former general counsel and company secretary to Santos Limited, which is a very, very large oil and gas producer based in Australia. Uh, and Graham Arvidsson is actually a mill workover optimization and development specialist. So uh, we really have a forward leaning team uh, and I think that puts us in really good stead to, to achieve what we want to achieve. So, you know, stepping into the assets now, we'll start with, Tark uh, sorry, we'll start with Tonkilia. This is, you know, down in the southeast portion of the asset package, and this is the starting platform for bulk large-scale mineralization that we want to put through a new mill. And what we're looking at here is a very large continuous uh, asset package. It's about 1,360 square kilometers. We have about 50 kilometers of relatively untested shear zone strike. These are major Kalgoorlie style shear zone systems. And in the Northwest corner of these projects, we have our 223 deposit. The 223 deposit uh, is a deposit we acquired when it was about 560,000 ounces. Uh, we upgraded that to 965,000 ounces in October, 2020. Uh, and since we've IPO'd in June, 2021, we've identified three new gold zones immediately in the vicinity of the 223 deposit. So as we zoom in on that area, what we can see here is uh, the 223 deposit there. That's sort of the historical footprint there where we've got our 965,000 ounce deposit. The important thing for us is the work that we've done between now and IPO is really demonstrating that the gold endowment of this area is much broader and much more significant than historically recognized. So. We believe that there is significant upside remaining in that 223 deposit itself. Why do we think that? Uh, the majority of drilling that's informed that 2020 resource was done before 2008, between 1996 and discovery and 2008 uh, GFC. And during this time, the gold price was actually mostly below USD $500 per ounce. Uh, and it only got up to uh, six, seven, eight hundred dollars per ounce during 2006, seven and eight. So there is a, essentially a very artificially restricted search domain in and around that deposit. Uh, it's about two and a half kilometers long. It's open to strike uh, and to depth. Um, and <clears throat> we have in the time since uh, also identified uh, three new gold zones as areas 223 North, Area 191 and Area 51. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, and even in the 223 deposit, uh, we are already confirming potential depth extensions. So just last week, we've identified or we've announced uh, about 10,000 meters of assays below one of the key depth targets of the 223 deposit. What you can see on this image here is, is the trace outline of the uh, uh, reasonable prospects pitch shell from the 2020 resource estimation. And you can see this pitch shell is very inconsistent in terms of its depth because of an historically limited drilling profile, which as we mentioned was, was limited by historical gold prices. So we have drilled along the base of the uh, profile uh, in areas that we suspect would hold uh, depth extensions of mineralization or potentially new gold zones uh, in previously untested areas. And what we're finding is a combination of high grade intercepts where we theorize potential extensions of no high, non higher grade zones so that's one strong validation for us. And two, what we're finding are pretty significant new intersections in areas that were previously untested that look like they may be entirely new gold zones. <clears throat> uh, in this case, uh, one zone called South Plunge, uh, which may be up to 500 meters long uh, and, and ranging between 25 to 150 meters below the base of the existing mineralization. So some very, very broad intersects there, uh, intersections there with exactly the type of broad, open, pitiful style mineralization that we're going for. And this is really validating our thesis for this area. The punchline with Tom Kilia is that everything we've been looking at is only up in this Northwest corner. Uh, if you can see my cursor here, my mouse is hovering over about 1 million ounces. Uh, this is 223 North. 
this is area 51 and area 191. We believe that this area has got a lot of potential to come up into that multi-million ounce resource base that we need to establish a really significant camp producer. But more importantly, Area 51 is actually just the first in a long list of step out targets. So remember Area 51 is about three kilometers away from the 223 deposit. So it's an, sort of an entirely new footprint, if you will. But we've got another 20 kilometers or so of untested shear zone targets. Uh, and the geophysical model that we, we developed for this area is something that derived of our R&D efforts. Uh, that's actually a target, that uh, a model that we have drill validated three times now. To all of 223 North, Area 51, and Area 191, their, their existence and orientation for mineralization are actually predicted by that model. And that model is actually predicting further repeats of mineralization as moved down this year. So we've got a lot of room essentially to go building in a neighborhood where we already own the whole neighborhood and we have a house on the corner that's already a 1 million ounce resource base. Now, if you have very large scale mineralization uh, and you're targeting bulk open pit, uh, it is of course, uh, hopefully an attractive proposition, much like we've identified with Carla Winda as, as a role model. In a more perfect world, you would have some high grade mineralization that you could also be putting through that to average up uh, your, your head grade. And that's where Tarkula comes in. So again, Tarkula is sitting between Tonkilia and our existing central Gullet mill. So Tarkula is very interesting. Uh, it has a very significant high grade history. This is actually the home of South Australian gold. So on our mining lease, which is mining lease 6455, sort of towards the bottom left corner of this image here, uh, this was actually the site of South Australia's gold rush in 1893, the same time that Kalgoorlie in Western Australia had a gold rush. Uh, between 1900 and 1955, uh, the old timers, if you will, were producing gold artisanally here by hand, so very much hammer and chisel operation. And they produced about 77,000 ounces of gold just from outcropping high grade veins sitting across our mining lease. And the average grade that they were pulling out of these veins is about 37 gram per ton, so one, over one ounce per ton. And again, this is a very, very large asset package. This is actually right in the center of the central Gawler Craton where you have three crustal plates pushing together. So a huge amount of deformation, a lot going on, and a lot of potential fluid pathways. Mining lease 6455 is a fully permitted mining lease. It was operating in 2017 and 18. It was sending 3.8 gram per ton to our mill uh, in 2018. And so again, we have this sort of proven base of uh, fully permitted mining leases a proven metallurgy, logistics, and infrastructure. And then what we're looking at now doing is one, spreading out and exploring across that mining lease to replicate the success of that open pit, but then looking out across the exploration license itself. We have already identified using new geophysics, a 14 kilometer corridor of sort of repeating shear structures to the west of the shear that created that high grade open pit. Um, and uh, what's interesting to us is you know, prior to our ownership, we can't identify any drilling done on this exploration license uh, for gold after 1997, which is when the gold price originally crashed and, and went down to in the $200 range. So we're really bringing forward some very exciting ground into the modern world, and we're doing that very quickly with new technology. Looking at that pit itself for a bit of perspective of what this means, uh, that little pit, uh, that's the same pit you saw on the cover of the presentation. Uh, it was developed to very shallow depths. It's only about 70 meters deep in the south and 30 meters deep in the north. Uh, but that pit produced uh, over a four or 500 meter long strike, uh, produced about 50,000 ounces of gold at relatively high grades. So again, producing 3.8 gram per ton. Um, but there was very little uh, investment done in testing the depth and strike extensions of that mineralization. The prior owner, uh, was uh, very cash limited. And when we acquired this, we sort of immediately recognized this as an opportunity. We started uh, drill testing depth extensions uh, and picked up some very interesting uh, intersections in what we call the deliverance target. We identified mineralization uh, over 200 meters below the base of this existing open pit. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, we also found an entirely new gold zone, which we've called Perseverance West very creatively. Uh, and this is a new sort of three to 400 meter long gold zone, which sits just behind the Southwest pit wall. 
And as you can see, we have some very interesting high-grade shallow intercepts here, which present an interesting opportunity to, to either or both of simply extend this pit or some easy early, uh, easy early gold uh, in operations, uh, and also to deepen the pit uh, and start pushing down into and pursuing that, uh, that material, which we hope obviously continues down. But the bigger picture with Tarkula really is the bigger picture. And as we step out a little bit here, the image you can see on the left side of your screen, this is now the mining lease scale. We've identified three areas that we think may host repeats of the same setup that created that high grade open pit. So these are areas where we have historical data mixed with uh, new ultra high resolution data, uh, historical and contemporary drilling and historical operations. And we think there may be up to three repeats of that pit. So maybe the potential to have two, three, four of these 50 to 100,000 ounce high grade shallow open pits on the mining lease itself. But then as we step out from the mining lease, just in the sort of the next 10 kilometers to the west, we have come and we've mapped a system of repeating shears and faults that were previously not recognized. So you can see in the image on the right side of your screen, we have mapped using seismic data, the perseverance shear. This is the uh, fluid pathway, which created that high grade open pit mine. And what it does is it goes down, it passes through the Tarkula basin, which are the mineralizing basin rocks in the central Gola Craton and plumbed directly into a large granite intrusive body. And this is one of the Hiltaba intrusive suite or body of, of granite from the Hiltaba intrusive suite. The Hiltaba intrusives are the engines of growth and mineralization throughout the Galler Craton. So these are the same things that drove mineralization at Olympic Dam, Prominent Hill and Carapatina through the world's best known copper and uranium mines. And these sit 150 kilometers to the east of us. They're on the sort of gold copper side of the uh, of, of the basin and we're on the gold side of the basin so we can see what what created this high grade open pit and what is more interesting is the fact that we have this sort of dozen or so uh, parallel and cross-cutting structures that were never previously recognized they pass through the same mineralizing basin and they plumb into exactly that same intrusive body so this raises for us the prospect that we may not have a cluster of high grade open pits but potentially a cluster of clusters um, and one target in particular, which is sitting out there, uh, which we identified early as attractive, is Warburton. Uh, there was a drill hole drilled there in 1997 by Anglegold, uh, and they intersected 16 meters at three and a half gram per ton, essentially from surface, and never followed it up. And people often will ask why. Well, in, in September 1997, the US dollar gold price was $300 and falling, so there wasn't a whole lot of incentive to follow up. But for us, that's very attractive because they didn't have the same structural context that we now have. And two of these structures are converging on where they drilled that. So we have a lot to go after here. We are currently going to do some additional more, uh, some more additional seismic in this area to improve the resolution in this area. We're running a structural targeting uh, exercise now, and then we're going to get out this year in parallel with continued 223 deposit and Tonkilia growth drilling and pick our sort of favorite targets here and try to rapidly expand this footprint. So as I mentioned, you know, we've got a lot going on. Uh, Tonkilia, we are currently still drilling. We're drilling at Area 51. We've just wrapped up uh, over 10,000 meters of drilling at the 223 deposit. We've announced uh, the results of the RC drilling, and we are expecting diamond drilling results for the 223 deposit and Area 51 to start uh, coming out soon. We also have about 2,300 meters of drilling at Area 51 with reverse circulation, which we just kicked off. Uh, the objective here is to take this into an updated mineral resource estimate in uh, April of this year. And then we're going to get right back out into the field, follow up additional low hanging fruit and our more exciting regional exploration targets to further grow this asset going into the end of the year, hopefully with another resource update. Tarkula, again, we're going to be looking at working very intensively, uh, working up our favorite structural targets, drill testing those intensively. And the idea here is to come to the end of 2023 and sort of illustrate something quite clearly, which is, look, we acquired these assets, we validated them, uh, we, we built up our geological theses, we drill tested them, we grew it, we grew it, we grew it again, it's going to keep going. And now we're going to start shifting our forward focus to that question of how we actually develop this. So the idea is to then commence feasibility studies uh, in early 2024. And of course, 
in parallel, one of the fun things that we're doing is you know, processing the gold that we recover from our mill. So during the next sort of six months, we should have an incredible amount of news flow in terms of uh, diamond and uh, reverse circulation drilling assays, uh, a number of uh, corporate initiatives, uh, and hopefully some pretty interesting gold recoveries and sales from that material. So uh, quite a bit going on for us. Uh, we are quite unique in our, our setting in the ASX. Again, you know, we have a very strategic platform. You know, where we are starting is where most people are trying to get to a million ounces in a mill. We are growing that very rapidly. Uh, we have some pretty lofty ambitions, but ones that we think are supported by our asset package. Uh, we, of course, have the ability to bring forward operations using our existing plant, which is quite helpful. Uh, and look, we're very, very focused with a very experienced team. We're well capitalized uh, and we've got a lot coming up. So 2023, we think, is going to be a very transformative year for the company. Uh, and of course, uh, happy to answer any questions that you may have. Well, thank you for that very informative uh, presentation, Alex. Um, so we will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. And just as a reminder for everyone, you can type your questions into the chat box at any time. So we have a few questions already. Uh, first one, Alex, how many more asset sales are on the horizon? So we have sold, as, we, as we've announced, we've sold two minority portions of our uh, of our central Guller Mill sort of mine camp, the village there. Uh, we may sell a little bit more of that. We've identified sort of a core of the camp that we want to keep uh, in terms of supporting the mill as a, either a mill supporting our operations or potential regional toll milling. Um, we still have surplus equipment uh, that, or that's either old equipment or surplus equipment that we'll look to dispose. But uh, by and large now, what we're looking at is extracting larger uh, pockets of value from uh, things that are on the ground. For example, we have low grade stockpiles uh, again, extracting value out of the mill in terms of uh, processing that material. So this year, we're really shifting more into a sort of project focused work, both in terms of uh, resource growth, uh, shifting towards development studies, and then potentially trial processing some material or potentially extracting material from stockpiles. Okay, um, on that note, Alex, just a clarification, the upcoming resource estimate, is it going to include um, Area 51 as well? Area 51 is a very interesting target for resource growth. It is it is sort of one of our priority targets. Right now, we've been focused primarily on that 223 deposit. So the vast majority of drilling has been on that deposit, pursuing what we thought were sort of obvious areas to look for mineralization that may sort of be hiding in the shadows of the football or hiding in the shadows of the, of the model that we built in 2020. Um, we are drilling Area 51. Uh, hopefully, we would get enough information to bring that into resource. But that, of course, comes down to uh, the confidence that we have in tying that mineralization together. So we'll focus on Area uh, 223. The drilling continuing Area 51 also means that it would take more time to evaluate that. We're getting those assays during February, March, and April. Uh, so if we are able to bring that into resource, and then that actually may be a second resource update in the first half of this year. Okay, all right. Um, so I guess uh, combining two questions here, um, you have about eight to nine million in cash. How long will that last? Good question. Uh, look, we we uh, as an example, we raised fifteen million dollars at our IPO. So we started with say you know, on the first of July. 2021 with $15 million. Uh, in that time since, we've sort of tripled the size of our team and drilled 30,000 meters uh, and done a whole bunch of geophysics, and we still have $8.85 million. And that really does reflect that sort of offsetting cash flow generation. Uh, we expect to continue generating these types of, of cash flows and resources through camp leasing and asset sales and, and extraction of value from these assets, as, as we've discussed. Um, so we are pretty cost efficient with our capital. Uh, if you look at that on average, we're spending less than a million dollars per quarter in terms of net cash burn. Um, it often helps to look at this in terms of uh, thinking about, you know, how we're consuming the capital from a drilling basis. You know, we, we as a rule of thumb, we kind of look at uh, an all in cost of two hundred dollars Australian per meter drilled for drilling infield support, people, logistics, assays, geochemical and, and resource modeling. And so that means for every 5,000 meters we drill, 
we budget a million dollars. That that would suggest we have you know potentially forty thousand meters more drilling available to us, uh, which can carry us quite some time. Um, and that's before considering any additional uh, sources of income we may have, which again referencing last year's million do uh, million dollar gold sale, we still have a second portion of that gold that we're selling, and we've got this material that we've just uh, pulled out of the mill, which. Um, you know, ten tons and ten tons of gold bearing material. We don't know exactly what the content of that is, but it should be a fairly significant number that we realize from that. Okay, so um, once I guess the resource update is out, are you formulating any plans to drill further, or is there a budget for how much drilling you're going to do for the rest of the year? Yeah, so we we are working on uh, since, since September. Uh, since September of last year, September 2022, we've drilled over 12,500 meters. Um, the objective, of course, is to get all this data, evaluate it quickly, uh, and do a resource update. And then we will be right back into field following up the sort of low-hanging fruit. Because as you model these things, you identify pretty quickly what are those next areas you want to you want to target, what are potential extensions, what are areas you want to infill uh, in terms of you know low-hanging fruit to potentially augment resources. Uh, so we will be back in field uh, very shortly after uh, the release of that resource update. Following that up, we would like to drill another 20 to 30,000 meters this year um, and then uh, grow that resource again by the end of the year. Very much to establish the point and essentially establish our own confidence that it will keep growing so that we can shift into development studies, so feasibility studies in, in common parlance, and then keep growing those resources in parallel. All right. Thanks for that, Alex. Uh, just shifting gears here a little bit. How much would it cost to refurbish the mill? That's a good question. We haven't done a formal study. Um, it, it does help. We do have a, a, a mill uh, refurbishment and optimization specialist on our board. Uh, we don't think it's very much. Um, this is not a case of a mill uh, that's been sitting for 10 to 15 years out of use. Um, you'll often see mills that require 20, 30, 50 million dollar workovers. You know, our rough estimate is that this is a $5 million uh, recommissioning exercise. So that's, you know, taking off and replacing uh, uh, pipes and pumps and motors and um, relining, the, relining the ball mills and, and replacing a bit of the, the superstructure. Um, but we've actually, uh, in December, part of this mill workover and clean out that we did was actually taking down some of the superstructure that we thought we might want to optimize and would need to replace anyway. Uh, to restart that mill. So we're kind of already going through some of the early stages there, and we don't think it's going to cost very much. Importantly, again, the ability to bring forward stage one of our bigger picture operations and start producing this higher grade material, um, the cost of recommissioning the, this existing plant, let's say it's somewhere between five and $10 million to be conservative. Uh, that is considerably lower than the hundred to 150 million dollar cost required to study permit uh, build and commission a new plant so it really allows us to sort of be the masters of our own destiny uh, and then look to essentially really establish long-term leadership in this region because that plant once it's operating uh, once we build our second plant in particular that actually frees up that plant to then look at either servicing the region for toll milling or actually regional consolidation of ounces uh, from the many sort of junior explorers who have now come in around us uh, and are following our lead in the region. So speaking of junior explorers, Alex, we have a question here. Given uh, the number of junior gold companies out there, what do you believe is your point of difference? Uh, a, a, cup, a couple uh, points of difference. Uh, I'd say three things are our asset platform. It's quite unusual for a, a gold explorer. Uh, to actually have the asset base that we have, whether it be, uh, you know, accessible brownfield mines with existing mineralization, um, existing infrastructure, existing mill villages, exploration camps, all of these are extremely valuable to us. We derive income from them and they eliminate costs. So it's sort of a double benefit there. Uh, and again, they do allow us to step uh, into operations. Uh, the efficiency with which we are expending our, cap uh, expending our capital is, is quite high. Uh, our drilling costs per meter uh, and our cost of sort of uh, discovering or delineating new mineralization is very, very low. Uh, and then and then three really is our people. 
Um, you know, we have a board and management team that is atypical of your traditional sort of junior explorer. We are really an advanced asset manager that is simply growing a, an existing resource base so that we can recommence development on a much, much larger scale basis. And our team really have exceptional expertise. We've got a, you know, over 200 years of resource exploration, development, studying, permitting, development, financing, and operations expertise uh, in our board and management team. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Alex. I think that's a um, you know great response. A lot to look forward to with the company. So we will end the end the webinar there. Um, again, Alex, thank you for taking time to host with us today. Uh, just as a reminder for our audience, our next webinar will feature green ship commodities, and that's tomorrow, February first at four p.m. Eastern. Thanks for tuning in with us, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.